everybody's terrified of actually putting their head above the parapet and, and going for it. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and it's my utmost pleasure to welcome a true luminary in the architectural realms, Mr. TJ Lyons, renowned as the unsociable networker and serving as the managing director at Cubed Business Development. TJ embodies a unique blend of strategic prowess and entrepreneurial spirit. Within Cubed Business Development, they pride themselves on their collaboration with some of the most esteemed architectural practices across the United Kingdom. They're on a mission to expedite the ascent of their partners into substantive business dialogues at the highest echelons of decision making. TJ's dedication knows no bounds as he fervently advocates for the integration of business development into the very core of architectural endeavors. And through this holistic approach, architects can not only elevate their operational margins, but also safeguard the future of their practices, thereby asserting control over their enduring legacy and of course the portfolio of work. So we're going to jump into TJ's world, some of his insights, experiences, unravel the experiences uh, and secrets to sustainable success in the ever-changing architectural landscape. And in this particular episode, we discuss how to stop time wasting when networking, how to not just network for network's sake. We look at how and why business development needs to be an integral part of an architectural practice. We look at how Business development is not bad taste, it's not time wasting, and it's certainly not desperate. And we also look at sales versus brand and how architects often get them confused. TJ likes to say people do not need to know, like, and trust you to buy, but they do need to acknowledge a need and be motivated to fulfill it and believe you can be the one who can solve it. So sit back, relax, and enjoy TJ Lyons. Have you ever had trouble finding an architectural photographer who could really make your project shine? Today's episode is sponsored by renowned architectural photographer, Tobin Davies. Tobin Davies eliminates the hassle by traveling to your location to create the stunning photographs your project deserves. And we are happy to support him here on the Business of Architecture podcast. Visit TobinDavies.com or BayawayPhotos.com to book a shoot in less than 10 minutes and ask about the special offer for Business of Architecture podcast listeners. Again, that's TobinDavies.com or BOAPhotos.com. TJ, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm very well. Thanks, Ryan. Excellent to have you on the show. Now, I was very excited to connect with you. We met on uh, LinkedIn, I believe. Yeah. And um, you run a business called Cubed that helps architects win work essentially and you work with practices all across the uk mm -hmm. um you help them with business development getting appointments set in the diaries in their calendars with prospective clients you do a lot of the the work that many architects shy away from doing or perhaps don't enjoy doing or don't have any systems for doing it well um and you take that all off their plate and give them the freedom to be going off and being architects whilst you essentially are a, a plug-in business development office for them um, and helps nurturing high caliber leads so that their so that their kind of principles can come in and close those um, inquiries for work, which as a business premise, I think is absolutely brilliant and would put you in a position of being um, an expert to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is sales. Yeah. and marketing so wh why don't we start with with them um, because it's a, it's a it's clearly a very important need for the architectural industry how did you get involved in this part this this world and why architects so <clears throat> it's a couple of things that led me to architects i wanted to be an architect as a kid and actually mm -hmm. um i started an architecture course when i left school and it dawned on me that I had another seven plus years of study and I didn't have time for that. So I uh, switched over to Wise. construction management. Um, it was actually as well a friend of mine who's at, he's, he's a successful architect now. He's done really well. But at the time he said, oh, don't do it. And so I, I did switch over. But it's always been in the back of my head. Um, while I was on the architecture course, we went to 
Barcelona for the week and went to, and looked at all of um, Anthony Gaudí's work. And that kind of got me really interested. But then also it, I kind of it dawned on me that the likelihood is I'd end up doing Granny's extensions for the rest of my career, not designing <laughs> it would take a century to build. Um, so I, that led to me build starting a contracting business. Uh, initially, it was just doing domestic fence installations for local people. And by the time I was 23, we had about 25 staff commercial fences um, all over the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a tough business, though. It looked good. We had lots of vans and people and that kind of thing. But <clears throat> anybody that's done contracting knows that margins are slim. It's a very tough business. And I yep. developed self-awareness that I'm really bad at managing people, especially tradesmen. So, mm-hmm. but always, I was really good at getting working. That was the one thing I was really good at. I didn't know what business development was at the time. Mm-hmm. I just, it was just mm-hmm. natural for me to give people a call or I was really good at networking and that kind of thing. And I was always drumming up new business. Yeah. So I had a, a, a very booked up sort of schedule of work, but I was struggling to get it delivered. It led me to deciding to wrapping up the fencing business in about 2017. But at the time, my friends or peers were saying, well, if you're not doing any contracting, can you help me get some work? And how did you get those contracts, et cetera? And sort of by default, I um, ended up doing, I guess, freelance business development. Um, I found a, a friend, a now friend, who was just a consultant at the time. They do a similar model to us in the marketing industry and effectively paid her as a mm-hmm. consultant. And they gave me their whole business model and I adapted that to the construction world. Um, and cut a long story short, I had a chat with my friend who advised me not to be an architect in the beginning. So do you think architects could use this? And he said, yeah, but a certain size, like the middle of the AJ100 might be interested. So we hit the phones and um, called the whole AJ100 and list and we took on Broadway Malian, who is still mm-hmm. on now. They're in their fourth year with us. Um, and we just smashed it for them. It just went really well. It just seemed to really complement their business and what they do. So I decided mm-hmm. to just go it all in on architects. And it's sort of compounded because we're constantly working in the same sort of property sectors and things and we're building insights. And now we've got a really cl- like a lot of insight into it. So when a, a client comes to us, um, I can look at a list of their targets and probably tell them the position that developer's in and exactly the person they want to speak to off the top of my head. But we've um, built a mm-hmm. database of 50,000 people in about 10,000 businesses on our CRM now with notes and, and on the individuals. So um, it's become really powerful for architects. So it's pretty, a pretty epic, yeah, a pretty epic um, kind of data yeah. uh, network that you've that you've developed. So that, that's interesting. So you decided to kind of focus on the mid-tier kind of practices, if you like, mm-hmm. um, or practices that are over, over a certain size. Yeah. Um, why why was that what what was the kind of strategy behind that as opposed to working with you know your micro practices of four or five people um so <clears throat> uh, there's a couple of reasons for that too we found that practices with less than 50 people just didn't have the resources to uh, to pay for us basically sure. um yeah also i was trying to build credibility in that sector so a lot of my focus was on getting clients that had a reputable name so when we call we've probably we've mm-hmm. got a handful of probably almost 10 clients that will be very well-known architects so i could say them to any other architect and they'll know exactly who, know exactly who they are mm-hmm. that was a focus in year one definitely a focus on architects um and but, but yeah mainly if they're too small when you get under 50 they wouldn't be able to outsource that whole function to us um, mm-hmm. although we're try we're, we're starting to work with slightly smaller practices now and developing a couple of services for them, but, um, it's not, mm-hmm. it's totally, it's a totally different offering because it, they sure. can't be able to afford to, it's expensive to outsource it. 
So, so, so what, let's say, for example, when you're working with a client, um, what kinds of issues are they experiencing? Like what are the, what are the problems that they're, that they're normally dealing with in their own business development that they would have them um, utilize a company like yours? We find that most of, most architects are either really bad at sales or they sort of look down mm -hmm. their nose at it and they feel like that their reputation yeah. should just precede them and we'll do wonderful work and then everybody will come to us. And um, that it's... is the, 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 the much perpetrated myth in the <laughs> yeah. industry. And although there's some practices that do that, if you're Richard Rogers or Zaha Hadid, yeah, okay, fine. Um, but the likelihood well, I can is tell not... you, having worked at Richard Rogers, and well, I can tell you, having worked at Richard Rogers' practices, that they were very aggressive salespeople. Yes, and this is the, so. I don't um, know if I'm digressing here. Pay is very bad. We spoke about this before in architecture. That's because margins are, are tight. Yeah. Margins are tight is, yeah. be, is because they're bad at sales. Any the, the reason someone like Rogers would charge triple what another practice would charge is because they're salesmen. They're, they're very good salesmen. Um, yeah. So to shy away from it. And think that you're above it is insane. Um, it's not that they're more talented. Mm -hmm. They're, they're recruiting from the same talent pool as you. Um, they're going for the same clients. They're doing the same projects. So why are they charging triple? And it's just positioning and salesmanship. That's the only thing that separates them. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. so when we, when we speak to a new client, it will be, so typically a business that looks down their nose at sales won't engage with us. It's usually the more commercially, mo like motivated and focused practices that will use us. So they already have, they already see a value in being proactive, but they will just have absolutely no idea where to start or have any, um, they typically amazing architects do lovely work, but mm -hmm. wouldn't know where to start on creating a new business strategy, what to say to someone, where to find them and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So it will be a typical client will engage us when they're commercially focused, but just don't have that technical skill or the resource to do it. Got it. Got it. And so, and so when you engage with a client, what's the first thing that you guys actually do? How do you, and particularly if you're dealing with a client and they're working in a sector that perhaps you don't have any experience in, or you don't have any connections with, yeah. does that happen? Or do you normally only work uh, yeah. with clients where you've already? Yeah. Recently a client has cut, um, they're an ongoing client. They've been on a couple of years, but they've decided that they'd like to do some more, some more work in the cruise ship sector. Um, it's something we've never mm -hmm. done before. So we literally put on the wall in the office all the cruise ship brands and all their sub brands, and we found all the decision makers and all the different brands. But every architect thinks what they do is special and what they do is different, and we couldn't possibly understand it. But the truth is, it's all exactly the same process. It's exactly the same offerings. Um, so if you're selling to cruise ships or if you're selling to a developer or a brand, it makes absolutely no difference in reality. Um, mm -hmm. If a client says to us, we want to do hotels next, hotels are a little bit more tricky because you have to find, you know, maybe uh, investors or developers who are building the hotels on behalf of the brands. But that's just mm -hmm. detective work. So that's if we don't know anything about it. We'll map out the landscape and we'll figure out who the people are. But we'll also look at, the first thing we're going to do is <clears throat> figure out your priorities for getting new business. In the early days, I made the mistake of saying to a client, you know, who do you want to target? And they'll say, well, we'd like to go into like BTR or something. And we'd say, fine. And we'd book it all in BTR. But then the, the results wouldn't be as good as they could be. And that might be because their portfolio is not very good in it or their proposition is not very good. Um, it, it might not be their strongest, their strongest sector. So what we do first is figure out their priorities. Is it to get uh, fees in the door or do you want to break into new sectors or do you want to build more market share somewhere? And then we'll say, okay, which, based on those priorities, which sectors would reflect that the strongest? So if they said we want to get more fees in the door and we've got a really long track record in BTR, we'll say, well, that's an obvious one to start. 
And then we'd say, what are there any economic factors that might affect that? Um, and if there are, then we'll go on to the second best one. Or if not, we'd go with that. But we typically find that actually we need to target a sector that they hadn't even considered. Um, or, or they thought, oh, we've done too much in that, but your priorities are to get more fees in the door. So actually, we should worry about looking at cruise mm. ships another time if this is your priority. Um, first thing we do is figure out their priority, figure out which sectors reflect that. And then we're going to figure out why. What, so we had a client recently have an opportunity with JCB. JCB had had right. the same architect for 20 years. Um, so we contacted them and offered them. I'll be honest, I don't really understand the technology. I'm not an architect, but there was the client does something with BIM differently. Right. So we use that as a, we say, look, we know you, you've got an architect in place and you're probably happy with them, but we use this, this design software and we think it could really help. Um, they took the meeting and they actually gave our client the opportunity because, to build a gym and a new factory. Um, mm -hmm. And that was because it, it's not about, <clears throat> it's not that they had this long relationship or anything like that. It was, we had a, diff, a, a an actual reason to have a discussion despite already being happy with your existing architect. Actually, this is another mm -hmm. reason to have a chat. And if there's nothing interesting that we come up with, that the client can offer their clients would have to be creative. So one of our clients wanted to meet developers. So we partnered with a, a, a salon in Fitzrovia who mm -hmm. could offer free hair styling because they're going to have professionals in their salon. They did that for free. And we created a women in property event. Uh, at mm -hmm. the salon, and then when we all the people that we couldn't book directly book meetings with, just to talk about architecture, we then went back to them and said, "We've got this event happening. We're really interested in your opinion. Please come along." And that got that got them in another way to get them in the room. But it was it's just coming up with creative reasons to get people in the room. If typically we'll get them just to talk about new business, so, but if not, so we need to work on it. So so explain that one again. So you, you organized a women in property event hosted at a hair salon. Yeah, like a spa. And, true, and yeah. a, like a like a, a spa. Yeah. And and then so and then so people so who were who were coming to that? Were that architects coming to that or developers were coming to that? Or so both? developers. Or, and it would be we were aiming for developers, but we mixed it up a bit. Um there were mm -hmm. the clients were the architects. We got some project managers there, um, a couple of a couple of others, but the main targets were the developers. Mm -hmm. um, but it was because we had a, a list that had been put on the side that said we've got nothing going on at the moment. We're not interested, but our client would actually wanted to build a relationship as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So that was just a way that just saying that we've got a really good track record and we'd really like to work with you wasn't working. So how else do we get them in the mm -hmm. room? Um, we didn't physically organize the event. We're not event organ we're not an event organization business. We just came up with a concept and just supported the client in getting it set up and then and then the and then the, invited the, the spa there. kind of invited everyone and, and did that yeah. and and oh, so, and so you, you kind of created or curated a guest list of yeah. people that you'd like to see there. And exactly. then the then the spa kind of organize the event and were you doing the invites or was the spot well, we were it? just doing the we were just doing the calls and um it's people we would have spoken to already for the client and they said we're not really interested we would have okay. gone back a couple of months later mm -hmm. and said um uh, we know you've got nothing on the moment it's not about that we'd like to have we'd, but we'd like to hear your opinion on whatever they did about women in construction can we hear about that mm -hmm be interested in your opinion. Can you pop in and have a look, talk? And um, yeah, it was just a way to get, get in front of them. But um, that's an extreme example. We don't do that very often, but it's uh, you do need to be creative in coming up with reasons yeah. to get in front of people because it's just not enough just to call up and oh, ask for a job. Like um, unless you have yeah. a really specific... Um, so one of our clients just finished a really fancy job for a university down at Cambridge University job. And... Another thing we're doing is we're taking, we're calling and inviting people to the tour. So they're 
we're calling state directors, getting them down to um, show them around the labs. And mm-hmm. stuff. Um, so yeah, if typically we are booking new business presentations, that's the meat of our work. But if there's people that are a bit more tricky to get in front of, we have to be a bit more creative. Like that. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. So the the services then that you guys provide, what kinds of things? So you're you're, you're doing that. You're doing a lot of outreach on mm-hmm. behalf of the architects. Um, what does it look like inside of your office then? Well, if I went in and spent a day with you guys, what what kind of things? What activities would I see that were yeah. that your team is doing on behalf of your clients? So, um, there's a lot of um, well, there's lots of calls being made, but it's not like a call center. Um, it's not like that at all. It's, if you think of a call center, we're the dead opposite of that. Um, uh, and there's lots of planning and research going on. Um, lots of talking with the clients, developing approaches. There'll be people um, doing role-playing pitches with each other because every time they get off, the, off of a call, we're all around the table. Mm-hmm. And if we think, oh, you've missed, you could have said this or you could have improved your approach like this. We'll work on it, or they'll go downstairs and they'll kind of run through it and and improve it together. Um, but in on like really the 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 day to day work is quite um, it's quite strenuous. It's it's quite boring actually. It's quite repetitive. Once you get the ball rolling on a on a campaign, the fun bit is when we get a new campaign mm-hmm. set up. We come up with a new approach. We do all the research. We build the list and. Um, all of that stuff is fun, and then it's just right now we've got to deliver it, and it really is That's just grind. Go, yeah, yeah. You just got to kind of grind through it. You'll have well, a campaign will be maybe thirty businesses at a time, and you might have out of that three right. contacts in each business to focus on. Um, mm-hmm. And we'll we'll kind of grind through that for a couple of weeks until uh, until we've got answers from everybody, um, and that that's the. That's kind of the rea- reality of it. It's um, it's it's been and are, are quite you, hard to. Sorry. And it, is it what, what's your main weapon? Is it email, LinkedIn, or f- the phone, or the phone through, by or, a country or, mile? The phone is the main wow. tool by the country mile. The, we do Pro- probably the most underused tool in an architect's office. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's a shame because it's the best. It's the best sales tool you can use. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I, and I actually, so I saw your episode with, is it Joe Air? Is his name? Joe Hare, yeah. Joe Hare, that was it. Um, from, uh, from, uh, from White Red. Architects. Yeah, and I would recommend any small practice to watch that video and pretty much do ed- everything Joe said. And I'm guessing that's what you taught him. The only thing that I picked up on what Joe said, and I thought, oh, that's one thing he's polishing up, is um, when he said, we did a lot of cold calling, but that was really uncomfortable. That's the first thing he said about it. And actually, it's not uncomfortable. He probably had the heating on, sat in a comfortable chair. Any discomfort he had was all in his own head. And, uh, mm-hmm. it, and he'd created it himself. And I think that if it, once it, once um, anybody that's doing cold calls realizes that any discomfort is producing their own head, and it's a belief issue, not a confidence issue, it's um, mm-hmm. it's a belief issue. And once they've solved that issue, it becomes so much easier. It's not rude. You're not interrupting anybody. Um, it, all of that stuff you need to get it out of your head. Um, but other yeah. than that, well, I- sorry. Yeah, I, I was I was very impressed with their approach. They 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 worked with a um, a business mentor or business business consultants, and well, it wasn't us. Um, but I was very impressed with like exactly what you're saying that they you know they kind of put created the lists. They knew who they wanted to be talking to, and then they started the grind. Yes, and if any small practices, any small practices, just watches that episode and does what he said. The thing about mm-hmm. architecture is it's very it, it's a flooded market for sure, but it's not competitive. Mm-hmm. 
because nobody, everybody's mm-hmm. terrified of actually putting their head above the parapet and, and going for it. So if you even do bad cold calls, you're already head and shoulders above your competition. You know, or if you un, if you do that's, that, that, that's really interesting. It's it, it's it's a flooded market, but it's not competitive in the sense that nobody's you know doing any marketing and you know they're not they're not they're not being proactive. That that's really interesting because I'll often say to practices, you know, they'll be like, well, how do we dif- differentiate differentiate ourselves and make ourselves look different? And I'm and I often just say, just do some marketing. Yeah, like just. <laughs> pick up pick up the phone and do yeah. something like be proactive that that is at this stage that is enough and yeah. there's such there's such huge hesitancy to 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 doing it and you know part of it is kind of what you're what you're saying is a, a perception of selling being beneath us we yeah. shouldn't have to do this and then of course the the actual fear of picking up the phone and and connecting with somebody who you don't know Naturally, at the market we're in, I've spoken to leaders at every single one of the biggest architectural practices in the country because at some stage. And when I spoke to Make, it's no secret that Make is, uh, they're, they're, they're a practice who's very proud of their work and they're very proud of that they attract mm-hmm. work from doing great work. So when I spoke to very senior people at Make and explained to them what I do, their reaction was, oh, "We no, uh, we wouldn't do that. You know, that's uh, you know, people do that look desperate." Uh, which I was surprised at, in a way, at the time. Mm. But um, anyway, I've it's kind of, it kind of stuck with me because it was the most extreme conversation I had about it. And then, and I've had this conversation with a few people, and then recently it came into the architect's journal that they'd had to sack 15% of their staff. And the reason they've done that is because they're not doing enough new business. You know, if they, if, and their attitude towards new business is that it's beneath them. And that, like I said earlier, that their reputation should precede them. Um, mm-hmm. So um, it's a, per- it's a perfect example that, if you don't make business development the center of your business and you think that you're too good to go out and pick up the phone, I think it's far, it looks far more desperate to sack 15% of your staff than it does to ring up and say, I'm interested <laughs> in having a chat about some work, you know? So I think yeah. that's a really good example of a practice who, who, who looks down their nose at sales and are paying the price for it. Yeah, no, I I think that's a really really kind of pertinent example there. Um, and this this I, I, even today I had somebody telling me, uh, um, you know, I was talking with a with a client earlier on today, and I was asking them why hadn't they jumped on the phone with this, you know, with the prospect that they were pursuing or this kind of thing, and they said, oh, we don't, wanna, I don't want to look desperate, <laughs> and this this mindset and we we unpicked it and at the end of it they were laughing and they were like okay no it's not it's not desperate at all yeah. to be doing this and how that that mindset is you know that is that really really kind of floods the architecture world mm. of well i'm not going to pick up the phone because i'll i'll look desperate yeah. and i don't want to be seen out. okay and you're quite right you know letting go of 15 percent of your of your of your workforce is way worse it's a way worse look yeah for sure. And you know, and and the and the reality of it is, is that when you get a when if you if you you know what what are you doing? You're when you're reaching out to other businesses, and you're doing it with the attitude of I want to help you. Hmm. That's not desperate. That's yeah. that's you're going out with the uh, I want to I want to contribute. I want to help. I want to be able to you know I want to see your business thrive. I want to see your projects get off the ground. I want to help you create and you know further where you want to go it's a contribution it's not it's not desperation and most people the majority of people are very rational and very reasonable and if you call them and they're not interested they'll just say oh no it's not really for us and they'll usually be quite polite about it and anything people build up in their head that you're going to call someone they're going to be shouting back down the phone saying how dare you call me it's i mean it's happened we make thousands of calls a year it happens like once mm-hmm. in a blue moon, and we'll talk about it for a week in the office because we'll be so surprised. But it's uh, mm-hmm. it's very rare. 
It's very unlikely. Um, yeah. And going back to this, so if you if you focus on business development, and like we were talking about, if you have Richard Rogers, Richard Rogers, and focus on sales, what that means is you can sell at a higher margin. So you can mm -hmm. select the work you want, um, which is the stuff you're good at, stuff you make the most money at, which means you can pay people fairly, which means you can retain the best staff, which means you can do even better work and make more money, and, and it just compounds. So it's, it's crazy that you wouldn't want to do that, that you'd want to kind of sit on your laurels, rely on your reputation, have no control over what work comes in, and think, oh, we'll just sack all the juniors when, um, when the work drops off, you know? Yeah. Um, it, it, it really winds me up. Right. I could rant about it for hours, but um, yeah, it's something <laughs> that I don't know if it's a good mission to be on, but I'm on a bit of a mission to try and make architectural practices realize that they need to stop that. <laughs> but, well, Enoch and I have been saying for years, um, you know, that one of our kind of uh, missions the business of architecture has to has been to make business sexy and in particular to make sales sexy to architects right and I, I ironically we've we've you know we've done lots of different sales training programs and courses in the past and you know we've found in our own marketing that if we call it sales then mm. there's a kind of natural aversion to it and there's kind of there's ways of there's ways of we have to call it and change the language and the wording of it and mm. you know and ultimately it's always blooming sales yes and it's it's like that's like that is the engine of your business that is the sales and marketing are the engine of of capitalism and they are the most fundamental skills in business and as an architect I'd say that you're selling all the time in your, you know, even once you've won a project, you've got to sell the client on the idea. You've got to sell them on the next phase yeah. of work. You've got to sell them on the the next, you know, upsell, if you like, of um, services or additional work or scope expansion or whatever it is. You've got to be able to be an on the ball salesperson all the way through a project. So to, to completely neglect it is so dangerous and damaging to a business that it's insane. And this is why it really excites me, the fact that there's organizations like yours that are now, you know, here, a, a, an architectural um, business now can start outsourcing a lot mm. of that that work and, and actually have full-time dedicated expertise onto literally the most important part of their business. Yes, that's the so, idea. <laughs> So, so, so let's let's talk a little bit about um, networking, All right. and kind of some 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 strategies here, or just some ideas. Because a lot of architects I speak to, um, they can get very frustrated with networking. Perhaps they join the BNI, and then they'll be kicking around in a BNI circle for for years and years and years, and pick up the odd job, or That's they'll right. go to these events that they that they absolutely hate going to, and they won't meet anybody, or they will meet somebody random. Or yeah. they'll do the, the 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 bicycle trip down to Mippen, um, and yeah. then they'll be like, you know, I don't know how many people how many people at Mippen fifty thousand, as I much as that, <laughs> but lots, yeah, a lot, many many thousands of people, <laughs> yeah. and then and then it's it, it's a it's a kind of hit and miss, you know, spray gun approach. Some yes. of the more sophisticated networkers will have a bit of a strategy when they go there. Um, so how can we, you know? networking can be a big time suck what are some of the things to how do you guys help train your clients in becoming effective networkers right so networking is actually something that um i'm very passionate about because what you just described there is when people say it's a bit of a waste of time that's because uh they, they have no strategy behind it they have no skills behind it um so when i went to mipim i went to mipim recently I, I had 30 meetings, 10 per day over three days. I secured four clients from it. Um, mm -hmm. I've never been to Mipin before. I'd never met those people before. Um, so I, I kind of picked up the nickname, the unsociable networker, which I'm, I'm going to start pushing a bit more because I've cre I got it because <laughs> it's the name of the workshop that I've been delivering for my clients. 
um, and it's, kind of, it, it, it's becoming popular. The idea behind it is um, you don't network to make friends. It's madness to go out and this whole this whole concept of it being relationships and um, uh, basically making people like you is insane to me. Um, you don't go networking to make friends. You go networking to prospect. That's what you're there for. So mm-hmm. when I go to a when I go to a networking event, I am terrible. I don't. I've never drunk alcohol. I don't go to pubs. If I go to a social event, I'll be in the corner, quiet. I, I really struggle with small talk. But I'm ex- mm-hmm. an extremely effective networker. And I'll walk into a, a networking event, and I'll be around within an hour, and I'll walk out with meetings. And that's because I go in there with a with an outcome in mind. So I'll give you an example. I just spoke to a architect a couple of days ago who's talking about coming on as a client and he said I've got a an event to go to tonight and I'm dreading it because I hate small talk and, and stuff but I just want to get my face known it was an organization he wants to sell to he said I need to get my neck face around I'd like to work with them and I said so what do you want to do with this company and he said I, I'm not really sure and I said who do you need to speak to and he said well I'm not really sure um and I said well, I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to find out the person in that business you need to speak to or which one, or, or, the, or a decision maker that's there. Find them, walk up to them and say, it's really busy here, not really much time to chat. Please can we, a really good tip is to have your business card to hand, hand put it in front of them and say, do you mind if we swap cards? Um, and I'm going to give you a call in a couple of days and we'll arrange coffee if that's all right. Um, People will, out of reaction, hand you back their business card. It it works very well. Mm -hmm. Now you've got their mobile number. You've told them, I'm going to call you in a couple of days, so they expect it. Give them a call in a couple of days and set that coffee up. And I said, then you can go straight home after you've had that one conversation. You don't need to smooch around the event anymore. You don't need to do any more small talk. That's all you're going there to do. Um, So I set him Mm -hmm. that task. But that's how I work when I go, I'll know exactly who's there. Or, or at least, so who I need to meet. So I'll walk into a group and I'll say, oh, so what does everybody do? If there, no one's there that is used, like that goes to my, it matches my campaign that I'm there to do, I'll, I'm not going to be rude to them, obviously. I'll do small talk and, oh, yeah, it's nice to have a chat and move on, but very swift. If I find somebody that says, oh, I'm a partner in architecture firm, I'll say, all oh, right, you, um, you know, it's really busy, but I'd be really interested to have a chat with you. Do you mind if we? get a coffee another time mm-hmm. and i'll do exactly that process and then i'll move to another group and see if there's any architects in that one but i'll work the room and i'll go and i'll walk out with three or four business cards with coffees pre-arranged um because i'm there to prospect not make friends. and um and, uh, yeah. and architects always push back and they say it is about relationships and to a point i get further down the line when you're when you're actually setting up projects and stuff Yes, having a relationship helps, but it's not the reason people buy. Um, mm-hmm. And and it certainly isn't the reason you're networking. Um, I think people mm-hmm. confuse sales and branding. So sales is why people buy. And in this scenario, it's even listening to why they should even consider you. They buy that first meeting. Mm-hmm. Branding is why they mm-hmm. come back. So that's if they like you and if, if you did a good job and all that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But it's just getting them to separate that in their mind and use networking as a as a tool to prospect, not make friends. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I like this. is very interesting, actually, that making a distinction here that um, in the prospecting, in networking, you're not there to go and develop a relationship. Um, mm-hmm. That can happen once you've once you're working together. But right now, you're striking up conversations with uh, you know, to help somebody ultimately to understand what their problem is, see if it's a fit. Yeah. And, and also the other, and the other thing is, I mean, I'll often say in the, in the context of sales, it's not necessarily that you're, that you need anyone to like you, but they do need to trust you. They do need to be able to have some trust in this, in the, yeah. in the sense that you could, that you could solve their problem. Well, yeah. So trust is a funny one. So have you ever had like a really bad toothache? Or needed like a root canal or something like that. 
No, but no, I could well, imagine. If you if you had a really, really bad toothache and you go to the dentist, mm-hmm. at that time, you wouldn't care if that man kidnapped puppies for a hobby. You'd just want him to take the tooth out. It, you wouldn't, it wouldn't bother you. You wouldn't need to like him at all. What you need, you, sure. what you need is a problem, which is your toothache, a motivation to solve it, which is the pain, and you just need to believe that mm-hmm. you can solve it. You don't need to trust even you trust. Yes, yeah, trust so, him so, do a so, good so, job, yeah, but you just need to believe that he can yeah, solve that. Yeah, problem. so yeah. So when I'm when I'm using the word trust, I'm meaning yeah. I'm I'm using it very specifically in that in in that they can you trust that they can solve your problem. Not yes. in terms of like I trust them with my with my with a million dollars or I trust them morally or who they are as a person. Yeah. That's irrelevant. Yeah. But I trust that they can do the work. Yeah, that's fair enough. So yeah, that's the three motivations that and even when you're networking, um mm-hmm. these are your questions should be based around these things. So do you have a problem? So for us, it's so you're looking for new business at the moment, or you know, do you do you struggle do you find that you're constantly doing proposals and not they're not going anywhere? Yes. Mm-hmm. Is that something you want to solve at the moment? If if it's a no, then I'll move on to another person. If it's a yes, then well, look, now I need to now I need to show them that we know what we're doing, but I can't do it now. So then I'll say, well, listen, I actually solved that for similar practices. Would you mind grabbing a coffee? But that's the three qualifying questions. They don't need. Mm-hmm. I worked with um, I worked with Jessica and Wiles for two years before I even met them. They're only in um, they're only in London. They're like 40 minutes from the office on the train. I hadn't right? met them for two years after we started working with them. It wasn't, I've got to know them really well now. And I'd say we're, we're mm-hmm. friends now, and, you know, but for a long time, they, they hadn't even met me in person. They just, I mm-hmm. cold called the, 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 the main partner there. I said, are you looking for a new business? He said, yes. Are you motivated to solve it? Yes. We had a few teams calls. He's convinced that we can solve it for him. And that was it. It, it had nothing to do with whether he knew, liked, or trusted me as a person. Um, yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's that's kind of the things that people should be thinking. Brilliant. About I love. I I, I I I like that. That makes it a lot more kind of efficient. So, so let's let's talk a little <laughs> bit about sales and brand, then, and where do okay. architects get this? I where, get this confused. Can you you started to allude to it there that sales is the the kind of the first part that gets you that gets you that wins you the job and then the brand is the thing that keeps them coming back yeah i think so architects think that their brand sells for them um which if you're a huge corporate firm if you're nike or, or marks and spencers yes it will um but you're not mm-hmm. you're you're even large architectural practices or smes we will call developers who have worked with the likes of Broadway Mallion in the past and have never heard of them. And so they'll say, you know, we've not, I don't know who you are. And then we'll have to send over case studies to show we've worked with them before. So it's not like you don't, no architectural practice has that, except for the really big ones probably. But anybody under the top three or four, nobody's going to buy into a brand of an architectural practice. Um, mm-hmm. So, let's. So, an example: uh, we've done a campaign to university uh, universities. So we are targeting um, state directors at universities. Now, our client had been sending brochures with pretty pictures of buildings to these university directors. And if I'm being probably a, a bit brutal. If you look at the profile of a university estate director, their background, they're probably failed at academics or ex-army or ex-police or something along those lines. They've ended up in this job where they're running the estate at university. That person really couldn't care less about design or architecture or anything. What they care about is, are you going to make me look good in front of my boss? That's it. Are you going to technically deliver it? So there's no point sending them a brochure with pretty architecture in it. It means nothing to them. So what we need to mm-hmm. do is, instead of trying to send them your branding, and saying this is what we stand for, you need to send them a sales message, which is, look, we know you've got a new lab being built. This is how we can make sure it goes really well. This is our track record. 
uh, and and this is why you should have a chat with us. But um, but yeah, that's where I think architects get confused between using branding and sales. That's 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 a, that's a great example. Is that actually not you're not yeah you you're not you're not using you don't understand what the audience is and you're sending them stuff which is completely irrelevant to what it is that they're actually that they care about. That's that's exactly. important. Yeah. And so how would you how would you approach developers? What what do you think is a kind of a good uh, strategy or a way of seducing developers into talking with you? How do you gauge those <laughs> kinds of conversations? So developers are actually like we find them the easiest people to get in front of. Um they're all they're right. so they're what we call a specialist client. They're somebody that builds all the time. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas a non-specialist client might be like Foot Locker or Lidl's. Um, and um, so we really don't have to, I don't know if it's because we've got such a clear profile on so many developers now, when we contact them, we kind of know exactly who to call exactly. And we have notes on what they responded to before. But typically it's, very simple it's usually we've had a look at your recent developments and we've seen which areas they work in or what styles they are and we think and we've got a track record in that area or in that in that type of building and we'd just like to share some ideas or have a chat and see if some synergies um that's usually a really easy way to start a conversation or asking have you got any new sites coming up that you're looking at would you like us to have a look at them and would you, you know, because we've got a really good track record in maximizing the values out of them and that kind of thing. It's quite an easy approach with developers. You don't have to try that hard. And um, they're typically very yeah. open to speak to um, Fantastic. Yeah. But, um, and then. Great. You have to be a little bit creative if they say we've got a roster of architects and you say, yeah, totally understand that you've got people in place. I'm not looking to change anything. You know, you, then you need like quite a specific topic to talk about. But um, other than that, you have to be creative. And one, actually, a podcast is sometimes trying to get a couple of clients to do because um, instead of using a podcast to market your business, I want to create some podcasts for my clients that talk about issues that maybe developers would be interested in and then just massage their ego a bit and say, we're doing this series about, you know, whatever they're interested in. Could we get you on to have a chat? And then you've got them in the studio then and just using it as a tool to leverage people into the building rather than even marketing it. Yeah. So you've just got to be creative. Yep. No, I mean, I like, I like that as a, I built a career out of doing that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, the invitation to come on to a podcast or even if you've just got a newsletter, right? If you've got a newsletter, mm -hmm. Now you've now now you can think of yourself as a media publication, and you yeah. can invite somebody in to be interviewed on your newsletter, and it's great because you get to speak to somebody about what it is that they do and to find out about them, and it's an easy sell. Yeah, it's an easy it's an easy way to get into it, and then it, and then naturally it's going to come up of of like okay, well, what sorts of things do you do? And oh, it was an interesting interview. I had it, actually someone did did this to me the other day, um, a marketeer. Uh, and they contacted me on LinkedIn and they said, really love the podcast. Would you like to be on my podcast to talk about podcasting? And I was mm. like, yeah, great. Went, did the podcast and they were asking me very interesting questions. And of course, at the end of it, I was like, so what is it that you, you, you do? Oh, well, I'm a, I run a marketing agency for podcasters and I help, um, podcasters, um, um, you know, repurpose their content and help them with all this X, Y, and Z. And I was like, we should have a talk. Yeah. And then great. Now I'm into a sales. Now I'm in a sales conversation with them. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. Really, really, yeah. really, really easy. Really, really easy. Yeah. Excellent. TJ, I think we've, uh, exactly. I think we've, uh, come to the end of our conversation here. We've come to time, but that was brilliant. Okay. Really, really fascinating. And I think what you guys are doing is well, well needed for the architecture industry so if people want to get in contact with you what's the best way for them to do so so on linkedin my name is spelled t-e-e-j-a-y lions l-y-o-n-s um cubed business development or at cubed bd on the instagram 
And um, uh, also, so like I said, the Unsociable Networker is some, I've got the website. If you literally Google the Unsociable Networker, you'll find what we're doing around that as well, which is, which is quite fun. Love it. Brilliant. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And that's a wrap. And one more thing. If you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. Have you ever had trouble finding an architectural photographer who could really make your project shine? Today's episode is sponsored by renowned architectural photographer, Tobin Davies. Tobin Davies eliminates the hassle by traveling to your location to create the stunning photographs your project deserves, and we are happy to support him here on the Business of Architecture podcast. Visit TobinDavies.com or BayawayPhotos.com to book a shoot in less than 10 minutes and ask about the special offer for Business of Architecture podcast listeners. Again, that's TobinDavies.com or BayawayPhotos.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.